Welcome to our uh, webinar on tax planning and asset protection strategies. I'm super excited to have on our accomplished guest speaker today, Toby Mathis. Uh, actually, when I started reading his resume, I'm like, there were so many adjectives describing him that I, I really couldn't fit it on the same line. So I, I'm just amazed at the number of things he does and he has time for. I don't know how you do it all, Toby. So some of them are like, he's a tax attorney, he's an author, he's written several books. He's a business tax expert and founding partner of Anderson Business Legal and Tax Advisors. I'm your host, Kavita Bartake. A lot of you guys know me. For those who are not familiar with me, I'm a principal at Cherry Street Investments. I'm a multifamily sponsor and also a realtor. A quick disclaimer here, we have a tax attorney on, so obviously he knows the stuff. But for your specific tax situation, please always don't take this advice literally and uh, consult your own attorney, financial advisor, or CPA for specific situations related to you. A few housekeeping rules. Everyone's on mute here. So if you have something to say, please use the chat box. Any issues with audio, visual? I've had a few connection issues today uh, with my cable. So if you have any choppy audio, please let me know ASAP so I can fix it. Uh, also, please locate the Q&A box in the Zoom application and use that for questions related to the webinar uh, because it's just easier to track when I've answered, when we've got, gotten them answered. All uh, This webinar will be recorded and I will be sending a link out. I usually post the webinar on YouTube. And if you want to avoid it from going to spam, please whitelist my email. A few upcoming webinars we have uh, are on multifamily lending options and how things are changing in the lending space. Uh, and we're doing with with a large multifamily lender. Um, the other topic is estate planning. And obviously a lot of things are changing uh, in the COVID environment and people are becoming a little bit more cautious or not taking things for granted. They wanna make sure that they have uh, done their estate planning and secured their, uh, you know, the, a plan for their minor children. And this is something I highly recommend you do if you don't already have it in place. Uh, please join us for that webinar. I'm also hosting a webinar mindset makeover with a very large coaching company on how we can deal with all these changes that have happened in the last few months and how we can capitalize on this and turn those problems that we're seeing into opportunities. Um, please join us for that one. Also, we are doing uh, ongoing webinars with kids. Uh, I, I have teaching kids uh, personally 11 to 18, and I've been doing it for the past nine weeks now, and I have three more weeks with these kids, and I'm going through everything from assets and liabilities, understanding the different cash flow quadrant, you know, if you're familiar with Robert Kiyosaki, uh, talking to them about insurance, taxes, uh, we even had a college admissions webinar just to, for kids to catch up on how, if they're in the process of applications or they're in middle school and what they should be doing when they start thinking about college. So that was really uh, great for the kids. Uh, all of these are on YouTube, so you can look it up. And um, if, you, if your teens or tweens want to catch up on it, it's there. Uh, my partner, Anar, she's actually doing the kids' webinars for the little ones just to get them to understand the concept of money, the value of money, just basic stuff like taxes and nothing complicated. We are really uh, making this simple for the little kids. So if you want to catch up with that or have your kids join us, we do it on Mondays and Tuesdays. So those are the links for the sign up. And a quick note, um, you know, if you want to keep up with our webinars, uh, please feel free to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Um, I, I post everything that I do. And uh, in addition to the webinars, we also do the kids webinars and I post a bunch of content here. So please subscribe to my channel on YouTube so we can keep you updated. A lot of you know me, I'm not going through this. Uh, just a quick update here. Um, I'm also doing infinity banking uh, policies for my investors. So I'm an agent as well, licensed in Texas and other states now. Uh, so I am uh, helping them set up these infinity banking uh, policies so they can invest into real estate with them. I was in technology before I got into real estate and uh, I'm very passionate about investor education. So I run my group, uh, which is called the Purely Passive Group on YouTube. 
uh, sorry, on Facebook, and also do these webinars uh, bi-weekly. And uh, please follow my YouTube channel uh, for a lot of content related to investing and financial education. So coming to our guest speaker, I spoke a little bit about him. He's very accomplished and uh, he's got, he's doing a lot of different things. He's also an investor himself. So he speaks from his experience as an investor. He is a member of Forbes Real Estate and Finance Council and an author of several books, um, including the first, uh, second and third editions of Tax-Wise Business Ownership and 12 Steps to Running a Successful Business. And some of you might have attended our panel discussion on all the COVID changes and the CARES Act with Toby. So he's extremely knowledgeable and he teaches extensively throughout the US. And I'm sure he was traveling a lot before this, probably a lot of that has gone online lately. Um, and okay uh, that. yeah. I'm okay with that. <laughs> <laughs> not, con not complaining with the, no travel now. No. So Toby's in Vegas and we were actually talking about the Vegas market uh, before we got started here. And um, he, his goal is to help people, help investors and businesses preserve their wealth, protect it from the lawyers and Uncle Sam and to create generational wealth. And with that, I'm going to hand it off to Toby, and he has his own deck, so I'm let it, going to let him share that. Thank you so much, by the way. That's really nice. Uh, don't get to hear myself get introduced all that often. I could get Thank used to that. Thank you for being here. I'm, I'm, I'm really um, excited to see what you have for us today. Yeah, so you know, so my, my goal is always just to bring value to anybody. I'm just a, you know, I'm a lawyer. I've been trying to make up for it ever since I passed the bar, you know. So I've been trying to just do stuff and share what you do. I don't like people that share stuff that they read. So I tend to be one of those guys that just focuses on, on, you know, what I've actually done. And I think any professional, Frank, you could just take that as good advice. Find people that do what you're doing and hire them. Don't hire people that don't do what you're doing. I don't care whether it's an accountant, an attorney, or any, any professional. You want people that actually have your values and actually know what you're doing. So today we're going to go over kind of um, a few different areas, asset protection strategies for real estate investors and small business owners. I will discuss kind of the difference between inside and outside liability. When you should consider an S Corp, a C Corp, uh, an LLC, which is kind of a trick there. We'll go over what all those things are. Tax strategies for real estate investors, small business owners, and a bunch of other fun stuff. I always um, like to just leave the chat bar open. You guys can ask any questions as we go along. Uh, a, my, my skin is thick. I, I don't mind somebody coming in and, and, and asking questions or pushing on something. Uh, the whole goal here is to make sure that you walk away with something usable, some knowledge. So I'm not one of those come in and have to be right people. Um, I'm more of a, hey, every situation's unique and let's, let's see what we can do as far as sharing ideas. Uh, about our firm, I was one of the founders of Anderson 20 some years ago. Um, my partner and I, Clint, who's one of the, the founders along with me, um, he's up in Seattle, Washington. I'm in Las Vegas. Our firm has multiple offices. We actually have the ability to be a registered agent in uh, I think it's uh, almost all 50 states. I think it's 48 states. There's a couple that we just don't touch because nobody's there. <laughs> Nobody wants to be there. Uh, but for the most part, we have offices, uh, three offices in Nevada. We have an office in, uh, in Arizona, in Wyoming, and in uh, Seattle, Washington. I'm trying to think if I missed any, but uh, those are our main offices. There's uh, over 220 of us. Um, everybody's focused in on investors and small business. So that's, that's what we do. That's what we've been doing for years. Um, you mentioned the cash flow quadrant. We taught for Robert for better part of 20 years. Um, I think I, I think 13 out of that 20. And, uh, you know, it just depends on how large the group is. He obviously has some other uh, advisors to uh, whether it's Garrett or, or, or Miss Kennedy and, and things like that. Great people. Everybody has the same philosophy. And what's weird is, uh, did you know where Robert Kiyosaki uh, first was a speaker? Mm -mm. At DC Cordova, which if you don't know that name, they call her DC the Dame Cordova, and it was it's the dangest thing. She she teaches something called Money and You, and, and and he was a speaker for her. But you go there and they have crystals. They have you sing John Denver songs. It's like it's like hippie money. 
And uh, if anybody's gone to it, please put it in the chat bar because I, I hardly r run across anybody who's done it. But she taught T. Harv Eker and Tony Robbins and, uh, and uh, Robert Kiyosaki. And no, still very few people know her. <laughs> it's one of those weird things. She's oh, got all these. I'm going to look her up now. Yeah, it's just, it's crazy. But they, they play games and they go off of, uh, what is it, Buckminster, uh, Fenster, they, uh, or Fuller. I can't remember. Critical Path. But it's a, it was a genius. Just hard to understand. He has a book this thick. And, and it's, uh, it, it's a lot of lessons about who you are and money. So you get to figure out who you are and what you are. So you can, uh, so you can own it, you know, so, it, but just completely aside, I, I, I love rich dad, poor dad. It changed a lot of lives. It affected my life, uh, affected my, my brother's life considerably. So there's a debt of gratitude there. And, uh, you know, again, I love sharing ideas. I love when people are able, able to articulate them in that fashion, just something easy to understand that can mean something to so many different people. Things that we should uh, consider. I'm a numbers guy. When you're dealing with taxes or anything financial, you really have to learn to be a numbers person. Uh, otherwise, uh, hire somebody who's a numbers person because you're going to be disappointed. Uh, this is a prime example of what's going on right now with this COVID uh, and the pandemic is if you didn't know your numbers, uh, you really suffered. You really suffered because you didn't get loans. You didn't get grants. You were on the outside looking in, even though they say that the PPP was open, uh, that's the Paycheck Protection Program, the SBA uh, forgivable loans. Um, they say, oh, you know, we give them to sole proprietors. It's tough. You still have to have numbers and you, you did not get to enjoy the first tranche. Like you had to wait an extra few weeks, which for some companies was a few weeks too long before they had to close their doors. So we're gonna see a lot of folks go out of business uh, let's talk about some of the, the, the more interesting numbers is there's 32 million small businesses, according to the U.S. Census. I don't know how many are going to come out alive uh, from this shutdown. You know, there's going to be a lot of people that are going to be affected, uh, but they're, just, they're never going to reopen their doors. A lot of restaurants, I think, a lot of people that made their living on a month-to-month -month basis that didn't have savings, I don't think they're going to make it. At the beginning of the uh, shutdowns, uh, the average amount of cash on hand for small businesses was 27 days. So they're, they're, they're in borrowed time. So hopefully they got some of the federal monies or they were able to, to find other monies. But um, give you an idea of uh, small businesses really are the lifeblood here. Uh, somebody says, can you make the presentation full screen? You, I think that's on your side. Um, can you, uh, is it full screen, Kavitha? I can't tell just because it doesn't show it to me. Anyway, they'll take the maybe. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not presenting, so it shouldn't have been. Um, no, no, I'm just wondering whether it might be the individual themselves. I just want to make sure that I'm showing you just one screen and it's not picking up two or next slides. Yeah, it's full screen. All right. Yeah, you have to select it for themselves. All right, cool. Um, of the 32 million businesses out there, 99.7%. Uh, of the uh, U.S. businesses are small businesses, meaning they have less than 500 employees. Um, half the workforce is supposed to be freelancers this year. That was actually an estimate for this year. And uh, just kind of freakish numbers, uh, 36.5 million unemployment claims in the last eight weeks. That's a big chunk. 75% uh, of workers are gonna be working from home. Uh, and this is what's really interesting to me, and I'm seeing this in our business. 7% uh, could work home prior to COVID, and they're saying about 40% will be able to work home from home now. Uh, so that led to a Zillow study, and this is both Pew Research and Zillow. And uh, if, if you kind of read the tea leaves and combine it, uh, you're talking about 50% of the workforce that would move if they're able to telecommute. And uh, that's going to be a big chunk. So for real estate investors, it's going to be very interesting. Now, this next one is housing starts dropped by almost 21% um, in the last month, which means for us, it means there's going to be less competition as far as building new buildings, uh, which is good if you're a real estate investor. And just so you guys know, I have uh, myself and my partner have over 150 single families nationwide plus commercial buildings plus some warehouse. 
yeah, we have a couple of warehouses, a couple of apartment buildings. Um, and uh, what's the most interesting piece? So we have, we have one that used to be a church in Savannah that's now a big old warehouse for, a, it's basically a Geico repair shop. But, but anyway, it, it, we're speaking from the idea that this is what we do too. We're in multiple markets. I have properties, uh, a few dozen in, uh, in Texas, mostly in Houston area, North Carolina, um, Georgia, Nevada, California, Washington, Oklahoma, Indiana. I'm trying to think of, a, I think we had some Ohio, but I think we just got rid of it. Um, sometimes we trade them out for something else, depending on whether your areas had a big uptick. Uh, other fun one, Zoom by itself is now worth more than all the air, major airlines, the seven major airlines, as far as market cap. Isn't that freakish? I just That's look at that. Crazy. And their, their revenue is like 623 million and they're worth billions. <laughs> it makes no sense. No, you and me both. I tend to, like, I'm a value investor, so... I'm, uh, I really care about my dividends and I really care about the asset, the balance sheet of the uh, business and uh, this freaks me out. So it makes me also think there's lots of opportunities there. Uh, here's a fun one in case you're wondering whether this COVID is gonna wreck our life expectancy. Our life expectancy shot up in the last 100 years. Like uh, I, I always like looking at that. We didn't, we, we didn't do too well before all this modern society thing came along. Um, so I think we're going to be okay. There's a lot of pandemics and bad things that occurred and our life expectancy continues to climb. So I don't think it's going to have a, a major impact on us. Um, things that are really interesting that we have to watch is the Fed effective interest rate has just gone into the toilet. They haven't taken it negative yet. I actually had a chart that had all the different countries and which ones were negative. Uh, our Fed has said they're not gonna, interested in going negative. But what they have done is cranked up their machines and really their, their balance sheet has jumped up. So if you take a look at their total uh, assets, they're over $7 trillion. That is concerning if I have cash. I don't know how much you guys pay much attention to that stuff, but that's an awful lot of money that they're dumping into society. And uh, again, I, you know, some of you guys have probably been doing this a lot longer than me, but it, it tends to make me want to be a small business and it tends to make me want to own real estate. Uh, speaking of owning real estate, this is the, Coomer, uh, this is the consumer price index of um, the primary residence rental. So if you look at this, um, that's been shooting up for many, many years. And if you notice what happened during the Great Recession is it kept going up. It went sideways a little bit. And I have rental properties in Las Vegas and I had them during that time. I still own them now. And our rents continue to go up. Everybody I'm speaking to when it comes to primary residences. So if you're, if you're renting out single family residences, uh, apartments, et cetera, I don't see this slowing down. In fact, I see it continuing to rise because we have so much cash hitting the streets. Um, speaking of cash hitting the streets, look how much cash there are in our bank accounts. This is primary bank accounts. This is, again, ridiculously high. There's a ton of cash out there right now. So there's lots of cash. There's people need a place to, to live where there's a deficit of about 3 million uh, houses in the United States and they're not building more. So I just look at numbers and I try to be logical about it. I'm like, hey, there's a lot of people. Our life expectancy is going up. There, people keep making more people. They're not making more real estate. They're trying to build on them, but they're gonna, that's gonna slow down here and there's a lot of cash hitting the street. So it tells me that I need to be in, uh, in, in that asset. So. Um, I've seen that and I, I believe that, uh, that, that we're gonna continue to see. Um, I just don't think the real estate market's gonna get crushed. Some people are predicting doom and gloom, but um, I think maybe the commercial sector is gonna get beat on because of a lot of the businesses going out of business. But I don't think uh, if you're an apartment owner, again, we, we barely missed a beat. Uh, I spoke to a good friend, property manager, I think we talked about it earlier that has uh, over 2000 rentals and they had a hundred percent collection rate this month already. And it's, the month isn't even over. 
So um, you just ask yourself out there if you have single uh, family residents, whether you've been feeling it, because again, the, the pundits out there are gonna say things and oh, this is horrible. I don't see it. Now, uh, the federal programs that were amassed to help fix a lot of this, the PPP loans, the Paycheck Protection Program, were really for just folks that had employees or for uh, small sole proprietors that just paid for themselves. The program that helped out the real estate folks was the Economic Injury Disaster Loans. And they've only processed about 1% of those loans. Right now, they're not even taking new uh, applications unless you're in agriculture. And that law passed, what, three weeks ago that they, they gave it another 60 billion or... So there's a ton of money. The SBA is completely smashed. Kavitha, I think I was on your panel when I said they're gonna have to outsource. Mm -hmm. And I said, there's no way they're gonna be able to handle this. And yeah. I hate to be right on it, but we were saying, there's no way in heck they're gonna be able to disperse this money. So you have exactly $8 billion that they've managed to get out from the SBA under idle. You've had over $700 billion go out via the PPP. Of course, they're giving it to Shake Shack and Harvard and Penn and what, what was the other one? Oh, I forget. They... The big one was LA Lakers. I oh, saw the it. LA Lakers like, got some money. <laughs> it's, there was another one. Oh, I think Planned Parenthood got uh, multiple tranches uh, in about 70 different locations. And I'm not going to get into that one, but I'm like, uh, I don't even want to touch it. You know, liberty or life. And it just seems weird to me that we're saying life, but this is where we're kicking our money, right? Um, fun stuff, but there's a lot of money hitting the street and there's a lot more set to come out. The Main Street program, which you guys, uh, I don't know if anybody has hit it yet. Um, in fact, I don't, when I sat on that panel, Kavitha, I don't even know if they had come out with it yet. No, the they didn't. I don't even know what that is. Okay, so the Federal Reserve, uh, if you saw the chairman um, this weekend saying that they have more tools in their toolbox, this was when they already took out. And what they said is they're going to buy loans from banks to the tune of $600 billion. So they set up a special purpose vehicle to buy these loans. And they did it, I want to say it's just a few weeks ago, and they're supposed to be done by the end of the month. And they're going to buy the loans at 95 cents on the dollar. So they're going to take 95% of the risk from the banks. The minimum loan is going to be, right now is what they're saying, is $500,000. And it's based on four times your EBITDA, your earnings before income tax, depreciation, and amortization uh, on one loan, six times that. And it's for anybody who's below, uh, you, you can go up to six times that and it's a slightly more leveraged loan. They'll buy it, I think at, I wanna say 85%. Don't quote me on that. They're still bouncing these things back and forth. Uh, it's gonna be a, uh, I believe it's going to be LIBOR plus 3%. So it's going to be less than 4%. LIBOR has been hovering between uh, 70 and 90 basis points. Um, so it's going to be less than 4%. And I believe you're looking at a four-year loan where the first year is deferred. And then depending on which flavor you choose, the uh, four times EBITDA is going to be uh, uh, equal payments over those final three years the more leveraged version is like 15, 15, 70 uh, in those final three years. You're gonna have a year of, don't have to make any uh, um, principal payments. So and there's gonna be a deferral. To all businesses or specific? Any business under 15,000 employees. So for the, uh, for the real estate crowd, this might be something that's of interest. But if the Fed a just, family sponsor, you could be eligible for this. What's that? If you're a multifamily sponsor, I believe so. Okay. Again, it's going to be your EBITDA, so it's going to be dependent on how much revenue you have coming in. Sure. So the reason it's good for real estate folks is because quite often we have a high gross amount, but we're depreciating the heck out of it. So if you're anything like me, you're doing cost segregations on buildings periodically and taking big chunks. We well, add that back in. So any depreciation or amortization you're adding back into your number, then you're going four times that amount. So if you, if you, depreci if you took $200,000 of depreciation, 
just off of that, without even factoring in other profitability, you're looking at an eight hundred to nine hundred thousand dollar loan. So um, I could see these being pretty high for the real estate folks, especially if you have a good sized portfolio. And I love stuff like that, by the way. I just think that uh, they're coming up with some really unique items to, to, to buy back from the banks to get the banks to push the money out. What people don't realize is the banks received about a, I wanna say between a, a 25 and $30 billion bailout out of that PPP because the SBA, the SBA is buying 100% of that loan 100% and they're paying the bank up to 5%. It's actually a sliding scale. So it's 5% of the first 200,000, then 3% up to 2 million or 4% up to 2 million and 3% thereafter. So there's a lot of money that got transferred to banks. Um, if you have any banker friends, you should ask them to buy you lunch as soon as the restaurant's open because they made easy money. All they had to do is push the money out and uh, write the loans. And uh, they did more loans, get this, the SBA did more loans in 14 days of that program being opened in that first two weeks of April than they had in the previous 14 years combined. Oh, wow. So you asked the SBA to do something, they just, they were drinking out of a fire hose and I don't blame them for not being able to do the idle loans. I couldn't like, no, they didn't have staff. They just said, Hey, do this here, do something that's never been done with no, with, with, you know, with no people in the middle of a pandemic where nobody can work. Yeah. So like they really, they got, they really got hammered and they're not getting a lot of love right now, but they did a, an amazing job for, you know, what they were tasked with. Speaking of tasks with, what I'm supposed to really be talking about is uh, active and passive investments in four major areas. Um, I'm just gonna go over each of the four areas, see if I can hold up the number fingers right. Um, legal lawsuits, I'm gonna talk a lot about uh, taxes tonight. Uh, business planning, and I'm, don't, it's not what you think, it's knowing where you're headed so you don't screw yourself up through some well-intentioned professional that might you know, think they're gonna save you a dollar and then they screw you up. And uh, creating a legacy, that's the last one. I know you're gonna be doing a webinar on uh, estates and wills, and I'm just gonna give you guys maybe five minutes uh, yeah. of having done this for a couple of decades and working with a lot of people on uh, the transfer of their estates. I'll give you guys the good, the bad, and the ugly in, in, in just two minutes of it. Uh, but it is something you should, when we ever, whenever we go back, we talk about, um, I'm just going to circle it. So I'm just going to, I want you guys to remember this. Legacy planning isn't about dying. Legacy planning is about whatever your values are, is creating a, a means of, of transferring them. And uh, when you create your overall plan, you should be factoring on what, what are your values so you can transfer your values. And there's ways to do it. A lot of people don't realize that you can, but absolutely. If you just give somebody money, the st statistically speaking, it's going to be gone within a generation, if you gave them a lot of money, if they win the lottery within five years, bankruptcy spike, like it's not a nice thing to do to somebody just to give them something without giving them a, a purpose with it. And, uh, and we'll just touch on a couple things there. But when you, when you build a business, a lot of people think they're just gonna give it to their kids. Doesn't, doesn't quite work that way. You gotta make sure that, uh, like this is a good one. Ikea is actually a nonprofit. It was started as a nonprofit, it was operated as a nonprofit. When Inger died, uh, Ingvar la last year when he died, it, it is broken up so that it can't be taken apart. He wanted his baby, uh, uh, Ikea, to always be alive. And so he made it to where it's almost an impossibility for there to ever be the destruction of the actual company. And even with his kids, who they, they're still rich, um, he only gave them a minority position on the board so that they could have input, but they couldn't control. Um, that's what I mean by creating a legacy. He had a very direct idea of what he was going to do in the world and he built his business around it. And now nobody can make it go away. It's going to be almost an impossibility to make that thing go away. So, um, isn't that wild? I just, it was 
like this weird architecture thing that he wanted to do. But I thought that his purpose was to frustrate the hell out of people that thought they could put together furniture, but I was wrong. It's actually about aesthetically pleasing and in, in uh, interior design. Uh, legal and lawsuits. Uh, what I always tell people is to say, what's the worst thing that could happen? And let's just go down that rabbit hole. So, you know, I'll just give you guys an example of, I had a doctor in Los Angeles and the doctor was looking at houses in, uh, in Indianapolis. Um, I happen to own some properties there and I know what they're like. Uh, you probably wouldn't want to live in one of those houses. Let's just put it that way. But they're great cash flow machines. So he was buying a house and he was like, oh, I'll buy the first couple in, uh, you know, I'll just buy them in my name. I'll just buy them for cash. Worst case scenario, I lose the house, right? That's not the case. Um, when you're discussing this, you have to look at two different types of liability. The one type of liability that is often, un, uh, you know, uh, overlooked is inside liability. And the inside liability is I own an asset that creates risk. So if I own that house or that piece of property, does just that piece of property itself create exposure to me? And in the case of real estate, absolutely. You could have a COVID claim. God bless it, the, the lawyers out there, only half the accidents are occurring. So they're, these plaintiff lawyers don't have anybody to sue, so they're gonna find somebody. And uh, you better believe that COVID cases are gonna come along. They're gonna, you know, some tenant's gonna say that, you know, your worker came over there to unclog the toilet and gave it to them, or you're gonna say, hey, I showed an apartment and I got exposed to it, or I didn't take reasonable, uh, you know, uh, reasonable steps to, to prevent them from having exposure, or now they're home all the time, they're gonna say they had mold, they're using the facilities more, whatever. You're gonna see more things creeping up. And I say it kind of cheeky, but the reality is those plaintiff lawyers right now are, are double whammied. And there might be some lawyers out there that would testify to this with me. The, the courts have been shut down. A case that would have gone to trial in six months in my jurisdiction is now going to be about three years is what they're estimating because they're having to do social distancing. They're having less hearings. They're not cramming these folks in. It's going to go slower, which means if you're somebody who makes your living off of suing folks and getting judgments or the, the, the fear of a judgment against somebody, uh, you're in a bad spot you're going to be waiting along like they could just drag their feet and know that they keep their money for two or three more years without even thinking about settling with you. So this is an actual very real situation. And these lawyers make their living pursuing claims against others. They're going to be looking at those people that have funds. And I have a feeling that some landlords are going to end up with a bullseye on their back. So you want to make sure that you're taking reasonable steps to prevent that from affecting your other assets. And so the inside liability, think of it like this. If I had a, uh, a box and, I, and inside that box, I put a bunch of broken glass. The box insulates me from that broken glass, right? I don't have to worry about cutting my hand, but if I didn't have the box and I'm holding that broken glass in my hands, all of a sudden I have to worry about uh, harming my hands. And that's what it is. Any risk asset is essentially a very delicate piece of glass. I don't care whether it's a business. You could have a, you know, uh, believe me, there's going to be cases against employers out of this. There's a massive, there's 36 million people just hit unemployment. And there's a lot of employment lawyers. There's going to be lawsuits that are, that are waged against people for dismissing people early or underemployment or discrimination. Hey, how come all the people you laid off were over 40? And you may not even have realized it. And uh, the next thing you know, you're facing down some, some significant liability. So you always have insurance, but you also want to put a box around it. That's inside liability, but you also have to worry about the outside liability, which is you. So let's go back to that same doctor. Let's say that doctor defaults on loans because they don't have any work to do because everything was COVID, 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 and they weren't allowed to do procedures or whatnot and they're worried they may be their clinic by the way before you laugh at me this is actually happening let's say that their clinic is going to go bankrupt because they had too big a payroll they had debts they had a new lease they had uh, uh, student loans and everything else and they were they were cash poor and they end up in bankruptcy guess what they can take now from that individual they can take their rental properties 
So you want to be able to protect your properties and your assets from you too. Now, the bankruptcy would be a doomsday scenario where they're gonna bring everything in and depending on which type of bankruptcy you go, whether you go 13 or seven as an individual, but you wanna take that stuff off the table. You wanna make it to where your creditors that you're a very small target and you don't have all those assets so they're willing to work with you. I, I'm just telling you, having been in this, uh, in this field, and I, by the way, I clerked for three different judges. I spent a lot of time going through trials on the, on the other side, uh, working with the actual uh, trier of fact and the juries. There's not a lot of justice inside that courtroom, guys. If they think that you have money, those jurors tend to not like you. And when you have somebody come in there, depending on what the jury is actually able to hear, what the judge is hearing, it may not be your, in your best interest to be sitting in that courtroom. You wanna make sure that you're forcing settlement. Let's say that one of your children gets into a car accident with the family car. Or let's say that as a doctor, this is the worst thing you could ever do is if you ever get in a car accident and you're a doctor, don't tell anybody you're a doctor, right? The claim just went up and there's actually statistical proof that it goes up because they think that you have something to lose. And so you just wanna make sure that nobody's gonna be able to find out what you own without you disclosing it intentionally to them. So like if you wanna tell your banker, these are my homes, that's fantastic. Otherwise, you create a liability shield ar ar around yourself not only with a structure, but also by using anonymity and making sure people can't find it in a public record. If you put everything in your name, it's really easy to track your assets. If you don't, it's really hard to track your assets. And before we get any further, I wanna just kind of go over what this world is. Because when you start talking about, well, how do you protect an asset? Everybody immediately thinks of insurance, which is fantastic, but insurance companies they're denying claims under force mayor. They're denying claims because this was a virus. They're denying the governmental shutdown claims that business interruption are almost 100% being denied, guys. So they don't make their money paying out claims. Usually the stuff that's going to be the most obvious that you need, mold, for example, usually is an exclusion under a policy or they're going to push it out onto you. So you, you want your insurance company to know that, hey, this is my max, like this is the maximum dollar amount that this claim is actually worth. You want both the other side and your insurance company to know that so that they can settle and keep your assets out of it. The way you keep your assets out of it is to keep them out of your name. And we use corporations, limited liability companies, limited partnerships, limited liability partnerships, limited liability, limited partner. Like there's a never ending, there's 50 states, 50 different flavors of all these things. And then you have trusts, you have DBAs, general partnerships and sole proprietors. Those are all at the state level. And you could choose, hey, I could go online, right? And I could file something. A, don't do that. You, I could pay the state. You could go directly to the state. You don't need an online program to do that. But you don't want to be doing it because the second you do, your name's all over it. You want to always have a third party doing these things for you. And then we look at third parties. Uh, I'll go all the way to the, the far over here. I care about banks. I care about judges. I care about auditors. I care about angel investors. And I care about lenders that I need to get money from. And I need to make sure that I look the way they want me to look when I'm setting this up. In other words, if I go to LegalZoom and I, and I give my, get myself a corporation, nobody's giving you any money. They're going to look at that and go, what the heck is this? This is a boilerplate agreement. And it's not going to help you if you were in a lawsuit. The rule of thumb is the amount of respect the court's going to give you is the amount of respect you show something. And if you didn't care enough to actually have a professional, I'll tell you, the IRS looks at two things whenever they're looking at whether you are operating in a business-like manner. The first two is lawyer and accountant because businesses use professionals. If you don't, then you're doing so at your peril. If you do, they tend not to beat up on their brethren. So the, the same thing with the bank, they're gonna look at it and if they see boilerplate document, not gonna happen. I'll give you two examples here. Uh, I'm in Vegas and we have Tony Shea who started a company you may have heard of called Zappos and they were, they were acquired by Amazon. Tony Shea created something called the Downtown Tech Fund where he wanted to promote tech businesses in Nevada. 
one of my uh, friends and clients actually was on the board that was, that was doing all the decision making as to who they would fund and who they wouldn't. We're talking about thousands of companies trying to get money from all over the country, trying to move their offices into uh, downtown Nevada or downtown Las Vegas. Uh, one of my clients uh, had set up a, an app. It was a bowling app. He came to me and he was like, hey, do you think we could get in here? So I called up my friend and I said, what are you guys looking for? And he told me exactly what they wanted to see. So we created a business plan that told them exactly what they wanted to hear. And he got money. Goes to another one. Same thing. I didn't think anything of it. I said, well, this is pretty easy. You just, you find out what the bank wants to hear and you make sure that you meet those requirements. So for example, if your bank says, hey, I'll give you a loan, but I like uh, the Main Street program is a great example. They will loan you four times EBITDA. Well, you better make sure that your documents and your, your numbers are tight so you could go in. And then you're gonna ask them, how are you gonna verify that? And you're gonna make sure that your tax return looks appropriate. And if it doesn't, then you amend your tax return if you're, if you're able to make decisions and perhaps delay some deductions or whatnot. You do a trade-off. But anyway, you go in and you show them what they wanna see. Otherwise, the answer is no. It's always no. So when I'm dealing with this, um, you wanna make sure that you look the way that they want you to look. So that's all we did. We took two people to this group. We both got both of them funded. One of them, uh, the, 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 uh, the app that was for bowling is a company called Rolltech and they ended up exiting to, with Brunswick and the guy made a great ton of money. We did his books, everything up, like everything was perfect. We did it exactly like they wanted it to be done. When we worked with the, with the, with the angel investors, technically that's what they are, they said, we wanna see this, this, and this. They will tell you pretty much exactly what they want to see. And you make it look that way. It's no different than if you're a hard money lender, you're gonna have certain requirements. If I am Corvest and I'm doing a portfolio loan, I know what they're gonna want. They're gonna want a Delaware special purpose entity that, that they're gonna loan to because they know they can foreclose easy with the court of chancery and that they have set law. It's really, really simple. On the same token, if I want to keep anybody from ever being able to touch my asset, I'm probably gonna go to a state where they have really strong protections. The number one right now is, is Wyoming. Nevada's right there with it. They, they have a similar statute, almost identical but Wyoming's cheaper. So we like Wyoming, <laughs> like one's 50 bucks, the other one's 400. Why would I pay 400 and I can get it for 50? Um, both are fantastic jurisdictions if I wanna keep people away. But if I went in and tried to get a, a regular loan off of that, I'm probably gonna have troubles because they're gonna say we could never touch you. So you always wanna be looking at it. Same thing, uh, auditors and everything else. We know what the IRS wants to see. I'm gonna go over uh, S Corps and uh, sole proprietors in a bit. I know what the IRS does. One of them gets audited literally 1,200% more often. One of them loses those audits at a rate of 94%. The other one is about 60%. The one that gets audited 1,200% more often and loses 94%, that's the one I don't want to be. 70% of businesses are set up like that. It's literally, you're just, it's just like you're walking into walking into a storm, I don't know why they do it. And then last, we look at the federal taxation. And so this is kind of our trick. I can be an LLC and I could be taxed as any of these. I could be an LLC taxed as a C Corp. I could be an LLC taxed as an S Corp, which is this little 1120S. I could be an LLC taxed as a partnership, as a sole proprietor, whatever. I could choose a state form and then I get to pick which one I'm gonna be on the Fed side and then I can draft my bylaws or whatever my documents are to make me look really good to a bank, a judge. Let's throw the SBA in there since they're giving out loans. If you were an SBA, if you went in for that PPP program and you were a sole proprietor or a general partnership or a DBA, guess what you didn't get? You did not get a loan that first tranche of, of $349 billion. In fact, you weren't even allowed to apply until the last day. And then they didn't know how to verify your income. To this day, we are still having issues dealing with the banks and the SBA because they change their guidance almost on a daily basis for sole proprietors. You know who else won't give sole proprietors money? The states, when you're going in there for unemployment. They, uh, this week was the first week in Nevada that a sole proprietor could even apply. So you couldn't get the money from the SBA and you couldn't get money from the state. 
you were getting hit from both sides and you had no uh, liability protection, no asset protection, no tax benefits. Yet 70% of businesses set themselves up this way. And the reason being is because it's easiest and they probably like a good chunk of them put themselves out of business because they went the easy route. Really frustrating from my standpoint because we sit up here saying, don't do that, don't do that all day long. And then people still do it. And usually it's a, it's a matter of money. They're just trying to save a few dollars. It's just that few dollars probably just ended their, their business career. Um, on a tax standpoint, if we shift gears to talk about taxes, a lot of people are trying to get to zero. Now, I understand that if I'm retired, in fact, Kavitha and I, uh, we have something in common. The infinite banking system she teaches, I happen to be a, an avid believer in whole life and, um, and index universal life. And I have a feeling that those are the products you're probably talking about. Uh, and the reason being is because it solves a multitude of issues that we have as we're getting older. From a tax standpoint, I'm, I don't wanna make my social security taxable. I don't wanna pay tax on something if I don't have to. And if I'm gonna confer a benefit to somebody, I'd like it to be tax free. And those products meet all of those. If I need the money, it's there for me growing where, you know who's not crying when the market crashes? Somebody with an IUL. You know who's crying when the market crashes? All of us that have a ton of money in the stock market. You should never be completely 100% in the stock market. You should be about 30%. You should have a lot of real estate and then you should have uh, managed assets. But uh, end of the day, a lot of people try to put all their you know, eggs in one basket and they really mess themselves up. You need to have these hedges. But the only time I see a zero as being wise is when it's taking money out of an IUL or a whole life where I can loan the money out to myself. I don't have to pay tax. And then when it gets paid back, when I pass, there's no tax on it because insurance benefits are non-taxable. The growth inside that thing is also under 7702 is not taxable. They're absolutely fantastic vehicle. And then something that happened to my family that I happened to take with me a lot of places was my dad was an early, early, he was in his sixties when he was diagnosed with Alzheimer's and he spent eight years suffering from that disease before it took his life. The only thing that kept my mom in her house was a long-term care policy. You cannot get that long-term care policy anymore you have to wrap it into a life insurance policy, which is a activities of daily living writer where you're able to take out money from the death benefit that you don't have to pay tax on to pay those bills. The average is about uh, $212,000 in excess cost if, if, you're gonna, if you have long-term care. So I know Kavitha, this isn't what you want me to talk about, but I have to say that is a huge, huge deal. As an asset protection attorney and a tax attorney, I'd be remiss if I didn't say, those two things you have to address. I have to address if something happens to me. I'm not going to let them drain my estate. I'm not going to leave that on my spouse and I'm not going to leave that on my kids. And it's easy to solve, especially if I do it earlier. You guys should all do this stuff. Like I'm not an insurance person either, by the way. So I have no, nothing, no, no dog in this fight. You have to do this while you are insurable and you really want to get these things when you're younger. I have three policies because I have business partners. So I have a buy sell so that my wife does not have to worry about the, my firm. It buys her out so that Clint and Michael, my two partners can continue on. They, it buys out her interest, she gets the money. I have a key man policy in the same firm that if, if something happens to me, I have uh, multiple books and a lot of material that I've created. It dumps money into the firm so they can hire my replacement. And then I have one for myself and all of those have cash value components of them that are growing tax free that can be accessed if needed. So they're, they're an absolutely fantastic vehicle. Now, a lot of people don't want to take that step and they try to cheat and they say, Hey, I'm just going to write everything off. So let's go back to our example of the sole proprietor who writes off everything. So they have no income. Guess what they didn't get with during this crisis they did not get a PPP loan. They did not get an idle loan for the most part because they have no income. They can't go to their bank and get a loan either because they have no income. They just made themselves virtually unlendable, unhelpable. Everybody's looking at them saying, well, you don't make any money in your business anyway. You know, do us all a favor and close it. And they're like, well, actually I do. I just write off everything. I'm like, oh good, you're a tax cheat too. 
you know, it, it's, it's like, it's not always wise. I see this a lot. Sometimes you have to look and say, if I'm going to grow, I need access to capital. I need myself to look a specific way. If I want to look a specific way, I might need W-2 income. I need to be an S or a C Corp. There isn't a slot there for sole proprietor or general partnership. Sorry. There, you can't pay yourself W-2 income out of either of those, uh, the uh, sole proprietor or partnership. You have to be an S or a C Corp. End full stop. You could be an LLC taxed as an S Corp or an LLC taxed as a partnership, but from a federal tax standpoint, you need to be one of those two. I guess I could say there's a third, which is if you run a, uh, a nonprofit, it, but you need to have W-2 income. And I need to be able to show that, improve that so that somebody loans me money. If I am building my wealth, you need to have access to capital. And I know like I'm one of those guys that doesn't like debt. I don't have debt. Me personally, I don't like to have debt but I need to have access for like, I have portfolio loans on some of my, on some of my properties. I do have some commercial loans on some of the properties because shoot, like they're going to be giving away money pretty cheap. I remember last time they did, that's when I got my loans. They're like 3%. I'll take that action all day long because I know I can do more with it. It allows me to leverage up on my real estate and build up my portfolio. Good luck getting a large apartment complex without it. Right? So you need to be able to do that. You need to be able to look, the part. In order to do that, you need to have your ducks in a row. Um, real estate tax in generally, and I don't, I don't want to get too crazy in this. I'm just going to kind of go over it. There's so much here. That's so much fun. If you are in real estate and you are paying taxes on that income, it's because you're not trying very hard. Real estate is one of those areas where lenders understand what depreciation is. It's not the same thing as writing everything off in a business and not showing any net profit. Here, I could have lots of cash flow, but I'm writing it off by accelerating the depreciation on my property. And the way it works is this. There's, 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 you kind of look at it this way. There's three roads. There's, uh, is it, it, I'm wondering if anybody here has ever been to Orlando and gone to Disney World when it was open. <laughs> Hopefully it comes back here. When you used to fly into Disney World, you'd get your car and you drive down the roads and every sign says Disney world. Like they take you to it, but every one of those signs takes you onto the tollway and you get to stop. And, and like, I don't know if, how your trip was, but it seems like every mile you're stopping and paying a toll. There's literally a parallel road that runs right next to it called Sand Lake road that does not have a toll on it. It has red lights instead. So it takes you an extra couple minutes to get there, but you don't pay anything. And that's my analogy for the tax code. There's the easy way that all the signs point to and everybody tells you to do, and that's the toll road. And it's going to get you where you want to get, but you're going to be, uh, you're going to have less money when you get there. There's another road that doesn't cost you anything. And then there's a third road that is a Audubon speedway where not only do you not have to stop, but if they do wave you over, it's to give you some cash. And we have a choice to take any of those roads. We just have to know that they exist. And most of us, we only know about one of them, but there's almost always three roads. And in real estate, the toll road is this ordinary uh, modified accelerated cost recovery system that 27 and a half years on re residential real estate, 39 years on commercial. And we're all used to just saying that's what we're doing. But that's the toll road. That gets you depreciation recapture on things that don't have any value when you sell the building. It literally, like if you had carpeting and you never changed the carpet and you write that carpet off for 30 years and you have 30 year carpet, you have to pay tax on it when you sell it as a depreciation recapture under 1250. That doesn't make any sense to me. So I prefer to look at this, this, the second category and that second category the non-toll road actually breaks down that building into its components. And some of those components are going to last seven years. Some are going to last five years. Some are going to last 15 years. And some of it's going to last 39 years in a commercial property. Again, residential is just 27 and a half, but all the same rules apply. It means that I could write these things off much faster. And then because I'm writing it off faster, that 
property has no value at the end. So I'll use carpet as an example. It's a five-year asset. At the end of five years, that carpet has zero value. If anybody wants to argue with me, you haven't seen the properties that were like, my, prop, my carpets get, uh, yeah, maybe three years I get out of them, right? It's when you sell that building, assuming you're not doing a 1031 exchange and you're pushing all this forward, uh, but let's just say that you were to sell it and you were going to pay tax on it. Like you're in a syndication, you don't have a choice. You don't pay tax on depreciation recapture. That's treated as long-term capital gains because the assets already been depreciated. When you recover a, a asset, it's its fair market value or it's treated as personal income if you haven't depreciated over its entire life, whatever the value of it is, uh, is left. So if you've owned that building for five years, you don't pay any tax. So um, I just want to let you guys know that like, like that's a possibility. So we can, uh, so we can uh, actually accelerate our depreciation. And then the, toll, the, the, the speedway road, that speedway road is if I want to take that depreciation that would have been five, seven, or 15, and I want to write it off in one year. I can write off about 30% of any building in year one if I want to. Under the Tax Cut and Jobs Act, under the bonus depreciation, it's up to me. And I get to make that call. A bunch of you guys are probably doing that. In order to take that loss and to make it an active loss, where we get into this passive activity versus active, I have to be a real estate professional and an active participant. Uh, or excuse me, a material participant. So I need to be a real estate professional. I have to meet, there's a qualifi qualification, it's code section 469C7. If you wanna go read it, it actually tells you. It's the 750 hours plus material participation. And I'm not gonna get into all that tonight, but then I could actually offset all my other income. So I've had clients that were making $800,000 a year in their medical practice have a spouse qualify as a real estate professional where we were able to get them back in their pocket tax savings of over $180,000 off of one property pretty easily. And it becomes a, it gives them a tax appetite. So taxes are just, are no different than, you know, when, when we're doing our analysis, we're just spending our time in here and we're just saying, hey, how do I want that thing to be taxed? Again, my state, I could be an LLC in the federal course, I may look at it and say, hmm, maybe I want to be uh, an S corp. And then how do I want it to look? I want to be lendable. So maybe I have, uh, you know, really good bylaws that are, that are uh, giving me the authority and making a lender very comfortable. But that's very different than what you're going to be able to do online. You want to have somebody actually asking you the question of what you're using the, the, uh, the business for. Uh, business planning real quick, and then I'll wrap up here to be because I know we have to do some Q and a, um, this is one that I see all the time in real estate. What they'll do is they'll put together an LLC for somebody. There'll be a single owner LLC. That LLC will not have a tax return. It'll go straight onto your page one of your schedule E, and then you go to sell it and no lender will loan on it because it doesn't have a separate tax return. We see that in commercial property, especially. You want to make sure that you're using a, a partnership in that situation. And if, and if it's just you and you're like, well, I don't have anybody to be partners with, create a partner. You can have a corp or something sit in there for 1%, but you got to have a 1065. Otherwise, the buyer's lender will not be able to approve the loan. They almost always have to have separate books and a separate tax return. I've seen lots of deals killed over this one. So you might be saying, oh, when does that really happen? more often than you think. And usually they're not telling you, you just have your deal fall out and they couldn't get financing. And they're like, oh man, I couldn't get financing. Well, the, if you go and ask the, the, the underwriter, eventually it's because they can't verify the data because they're looking at your individual, somebody's individual return and looking at the schedule E saying this, this is mixed in with a bunch of other properties. We don't know how this property actually did and we can't base it on just your financials. So they want to see that separate tax return. So don't fall for that. You're, somebody might say, oh, but we can get away from filing a tax return. They're doing you a favor. They're saving you a few hundred bucks at the expense of being able to actually take the big payday. 
uh, sole proprietor versus an S corp. I let the numbers do the talking on this. I can run both scenarios. If you're making $100,000 a year, uh, I'm gonna pay myself a small salary out of an S corp, which by the way, would make me eligible for certain types of loans that otherwise I wouldn't be. But what I look at is the bottom line. I'm taking everything into account here, guys. I'm looking at the uh, 199A 20% deduction under the Tax Cut and Jobs Act. I'm not playing phase outs. I'm not doing anything differently. I'm writing off the portion of the, uh, of the uh, self-employment tax. But the easiest way to look at this is every dollar you make from your hard work as a sole proprietor is subject to Social Security. It's subject to old, days, uh, old age, death, and survivors and Medicare. And it's going to hit you no matter what. It doesn't phase out. Like people say, oh, it phases out. No, a portion of it does. The old age, death, and survivors, but not the Medicare portion. It goes on for infinity at 2.9%. So you're going to get hit with a tax that you could avoid if you set up an S Corp. And the difference is on that 100000 is a little over 7600 bucks per year. Now, what this doesn't factor in is that when I set up an S Corp, I can now qualify for something called an accountable plan that you cannot do as a sole proprietor or as a partnership. An accountable plan, if you want to go look them up, I think it's the Code of Federal Regulations, so it'd be 25 CFR 162-2, and you're going to go look in there, and you're going to see that it says, hey, an employer can reimburse you stuff, and you don't have to report it. So if I was, uh, let's say Kavitha has uh, employees and she says, hey, on your way over to the office, stop off and um, the donut shop is now open. I like donuts, Kavitha. I know you probably would never eat one. But let's say that you say to your employee, pick up some donuts on the way in. They bring them in and they spend a hundred bucks. Kavitha can literally write them a check for a hundred bucks or give them cash for a hundred bucks. They don't have to report it anywhere. Kavitha gets to write that, that off as an ordinary necessary expense on her business. So she gets a deduction. It works no differently when you are the owner of an S Corp. Now I can write off everything from um, uh, my administrative office in my house, something called 280A where I can rent my uh, home to my business uh, for less than 14 days a year. I don't have to record it. That's where I'm going to do my corporate meetings. I could have a portion. Usually it's about 20% of your house that you could write off a deduction from the business to you as a reimbursement of about 20% of your real estate tax, 20% of your utilities, 20%, if you have a house cleaner, it's 20% of the house cleaner. But I don't have to report it as an individual, but the business gets to take that as a deduction. So, so there are other taxable benefits that so come in. So Tim, there was a question uh, from a lot of people before the meeting. Uh, is there a time where it makes sense to just not be an LLC and actually become an S Corp? Is there like a, an income limit or a revenue limit that makes sense. It makes sense. All right. So there's, so I always look at a few different things. So I could be a, a sole proprietor and still be an LLC. An LLC is not a tax characteristic. So I could still do that and it, and it, 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 it really gives you a lot of protection on, uh, you know, so let's say somebody's going to sue the business. You do something, let's say I'm a plumbing business and, and, Somebody, I flood somebody's house and they sue me. The LLC creates the liability protection around that business. So that would be stuck inside of it. Um, but I still have the tax treatment as a sole proprietor. I would say that when you get over $30,000, it becomes more beneficial to be the S Corp from a tax standpoint than just an LLC. I would want to see what, what else comes of it. Uh, and I could take that same LLC, even though it was a sole proprietor, and I could reclassify it the following year as an S Corp. And I wouldn't have to change my name or anything. I don't have to do a new filing with the state. I just change it with the federal government. That's all I'm doing. And I, and I make that, that one change. So um, I would always say, create the liability protection around yourself. It's almost always gonna be an LLC these days. The only time you use a corporation, a corporation proper, is if you are going to put some money into it and you might lose your money. And the only reason we do that is because we can make something called a 1244 stock election where we can write it off. Um, 
real quick and then I'll finish up that legacy I already talked about. You have two choices whenever you're doing your estate plan. You have the, uh, I could go through the state process, which is probate, or I could ignore it. Yeah, let's ignore it. We'll, we'll cover another session for estate planning. Yep. Let me give you guys a quick giveaway. Uh, just because you were a good audience. And I know some people are talking, uh, I'll go over your questions about asset Toby, protection. I had a question before you go to the giveaway. What was the, oh, you said, how do you slash your tax bill with one simple form? What was that form? I missed that. Uh, that would actually be a uh, 2553. I'm actually slashing my taxes. Under real estate, it would be a 3115 to make the change of uh, accounting election to where I say, I don't want, the modified accelerated cost recovery system. I choose to be a cost segregation and I have my building cost segregated in an active business. It's if I was a um, LLC taxes, a sole proprietor, I can file a single 2553 and make myself into an S corporation from a tax standpoint. Got it. Those Thank are the two. For, those are either one of those is going to save you a significant amount of money on a, uh, on, a, on an annual basis. And by the way, that cost seg could save you monies even before you sell. It's pretty ridiculous what it could actually do. We actually had a, uh, a warehouse that it saved them almost $70,000 by doing the cost segregation right before they sold. Because again, when you have uh, assets that have been used during their useful life and they've been used up, if you don't do that, you're paying uh, you're, you're paying depreciation recapture, which is up to 25%. Mm -hmm. If you do do that, nada. It's just being added into the uh, long-term capital gains. Um, I know about your questions. I'll get into the asset protection side too. Love to be able to go over some of those. Giveaway real quick. I'll give you guys all the fourth edition of TaxWise Business Ownership. Um, I'm going to make this super, super simple. It's free. I'll give you guys the website you can go to. This is uh, only through Kavitha and I think you have to type in Cherry. I'll give you guys the, uh, the deal. You're going to get a strategy session along with it because this does not exist in my world. There's no one size fits all. We always want to talk about, we always want to talk to people. Um, but you're going to use the code. Let me get the uh, right color. You're going to use the code Cherry in all caps, and that will give you that book and the shipping for free. So you guys can get some uh, free mind food. It does go over all the different types of entity structures and about 100 different tax deductions. Um, do you want me to jump into the questions or do you wanna go over some of the questions? Sure, I can go into the questions. Uh, so Arun asks, is if one is in only invested in private syndications, either as a GP or an LP and is sued, will the suing attorney be able to discover the private syndication investments? So if you were sued as the individual and you were an individual investor, they're gonna be able to discover at the end of your suit, your investment, unless you are listed in a public record. So the way a lawsuit generally works is, let's say I get into a car accident, I'm going to get sued for negligent driving. They're going to try to get discovery on me. Sometimes people are willing to, to hand over your financials. I would say fight it tooth and nail um, because a lot of lawyers think that's going to uh, show them that you don't have assets. What you want to do is ha let them litigate that suit as to whether you're negligent. Let's just, let's just assume that you were and it exceeds your policy limits, then they're probably going to be looking at your financial situation and you would disclose to them at that point that you have an interest in a, uh, in a private syndication. Um, if you put that into a holding LLC, that's a different ball of wax. If I invest through an LLC that goes into the syndication, then even disclosing that LLC, they can't get to it. The, the reason we use Wyoming, the reason that we use Nevada, is because those two jurisdictions do not allow somebody to foreclose on your interest. The most they can get is a lien against your interest. So it's called a charging order. And it's pretty brutal because uh, they can never make you give them the funds inside it. You could just sit there and wait them out 
uh, there is one situation where the taxes were owed by the the uh, the uh, charging order holder. So most lawyers won't touch them. I've not seen one in the last 20 years. Okay, that's great. Um, so one more question is, we didn't speak much about asset protection. What are the difficulties in moving real estate from personal name to LLC? Can the mortgage be called? In this era, isn't there a two-year limit in time limit in Nevada, longer elsewhere where fraudulent conveyance can become an issue? No, so let's, so there's actually two different issues there. Number one is, is, is when you have a uh, loan on a piece of property in your name, whether conveying it into an entity allows the lender to call that note due. And what we do when it's residential property, um, A, we haven't seen that issue. We've seen it pop up once and we do, just to give you guys an idea, tens of thousands of transactions. We've seen it happen once in the last few years. The easy fix is just to use a land trust. So I would convey it to you as trustee or to a party where we show the lender, the grantor, and then we would assign that beneficial interest to the LLC. So there's an easy workaround if you have a lender who's being rabid. Most don't. Yeah. And then in the commercial realm, I have not seen a lender that would actually loan to an individual in their individual name, except for some of the hard money guys, then even them, most of them nowadays only want to deal with you as an entity, as an LLC. They'll have you as a guarantor, but the entity, it, the asset is actually the, uh, the security. They want to know that they don't have to worry about your outside liabilities, uh, fill in the blank, your divorce, your, you know, maybe you got into a car accident, you know, whatever, your kids did something funky, they insulted somebody and they got sued, whatever the case, uh, they don't want to deal with that. So they want to loan to an entity only and they want to secure it with the real estate. Residential is a little bit different. And so they'll still loan to you as an individual just because that's what they're doing under those mortgages. And then we would just convey it to a land trust if there was any issue. Uh, depending on your state, it might be wise to do that anyway. Um, it's actually really simple. It's just either you're doing a warranty deed over so that the title doesn't get killed. Um, it just depends on your county as to what they call it. What you don't do, I'm just going to give you guys a, a heads up. Don't quit claim over your property to an LLC because you'll violate the uh, title insurance and you'll lose it. So you almost always do a warranty deed or, or something similar. And uh, it's really easy. It goes your name. It, it goes Andrew Mathis, to, which is my legal name. A.T. Mathis to A.T. Mathis trustee of the 123 Trust, if I wanted to do it that way. If I want to keep my name off it, then I might use an entity instead. I might do the ABC LLC as trustee of the 123 Trust and have that LLC be a Wyoming entity where my name's not associated with it. And then when I go to the uh, lender, they're going to ask to see the trust document. They're going to see that I am the beneficiary I am the, uh, the grantor, and that's called a grantor trust, and you're going to be as good as gold. So, um, Toby, a quick question. Uh, a lot of people are commenting that the, they can't get the book with the link which was shared. They, they're only able to go to the strategy session sign up, but they're not no, we're able send, to We send out the book. You just complete it. If you put in uh, Cherry, then you'll be good. Okay. So you could just sign up for the strategy session and they'll send the book. We automatically send you the free book. This is uh, as long as you're using that aba.link forward slash Kavitha, then we know it comes from you. And uh, if anybody has any issues with that, please, if you just, Kavitha, just send an email to Kavitha and she can tell me, Hey, here's the people and we'll, we'll, we'll take care of it for you. There's no way to put the code. Okay. Uh, we'll take that offline. I it's, think a, it's, it's a physical book, guys. We're actually sending out. It's a hardbound book. So we'll, we'll sort the book issue out. Uh, I'll make sure that I can send in instructions in case you have any issues. Please email me. In I want to get to the questions today. Um, mm -hmm. How is Texas ranked when compared to Wyoming as a protective state? Texas is actually pretty good. The, the biggest difference with Texas is that you're... you're uh, um, is that you're listed, your, your information is listed. So it, it could be a little bit of a problem there. Um, is that yeah, you, you personally will have your, whatever the address is, your name would be associated with it as well. 
But There's ways to work around that. registered agent's address there and not yours? We can use the, the registered agent, but your name would still be on there as a, as a member or a manager. Okay. So the, the question is, in any given state, as to whether they require that you, whenever you change the name of the manager or the member, depending on which one you are acting as, I would always say be a, a, a manager managed is probably about 90% of them. Um, what we'll do is, uh, it, it, again, it depends on the jurisdiction, but if you're a manager managed and it requires a local name to be listed down, then you just, you're going to be out there in the public record. They can look you up and see that you have the LLC. So if you, again, think like the lawyer, the lawyer is going after you, Kavitha, they're going to type your name in, do an asset search in your state to see if there's any assets. If your name pops up on them, they're going to, they're going to flag those and they're going to assume that you own them. Mm -hmm. um, the, there is a way to get around that. And that just is by having the uh, Wyoming entity be the member, uh, be member managed and set it up. Then it would point back to Wyoming and all Wyoming does is they only require the incorporator, which is us. So your name's not listed anywhere. Nobody can see it. Nobody could find it. The bank might know, but your bank records are private. If you file a tax return, that would be on your tax return, but as Mr. Trump or President Trump has shown us, your tax returns are also private. <laughs> okay, uh, one more question here. Um, I have asset protection structures set up already. However, I'm not confident I'm fully covered and the strategy I'm using is the best and most cost effective. Is there a company that can evaluate the existing structure, identify potential gaps? That's what you guys do. <laughs> That's exactly what we do. And we do that as a complimentary. So when I say a book and strategy session, it's a blueprint. We actually draw out what you would look like. Uh, we do something called the risk reduction formula where we're looking at what type of asset it is, what type of exposure. Um, one of the things that we'd never do, for example, is we'd never take an asset like in Texas, you guys have an unlimited homestead. I would never put that in LLC where I could lose my homestead exclusion. Just never would, because I undo that huge protection. There's protections on cash value of life insurance in many jurisdictions. I'm not gonna mess around with that. I don't want to mess around with that. It's first do no harm. Okay, so um, they're saying that there's no address uh, entered in the link. So how right. do you- Right, so Amy, Amy will reach out. Amy is the one who worked, uh, was talking with you. She's gonna reach out and get everybody's information and get them all Yeah, started. I'll make sure that I send those instructions when I'm sending the recording for the webinar. I'll make sure that that's sorted out mm -hmm. and you get a link that works for both the book as well as the strategy session. Yeah, uh, and I'll, I'll send over, well, it could be that I tested it beforehand, so maybe there's something weird with the short link, but uh, I'll see if the long free. website. Yeah, we'll make sure. We're gonna give you guys all a free book and we'll give you all a free blueprint. Somehow, some way, we'll get it to you. We'll get it done. We'll have uh, to walk Klaus. it to your house. <laughs> uh, Klaus asks, I started investing in multifamily as a passive last calendar year. I'm planning to do going forward. I was wondering if I, it would make sense for me to set up an LLC for my multifamily investments from a tax and asset protection perspective. What are the pros and cons? So, case, and I hate to say this. Yes, an LLC for multifamily investments. Any recommendation for which state to set up? How would I link the LLC to an existing trust? So there are three questions there. I know that's like, I'm trying to break them out in my head. I'm gonna, oh, can you shoot that over at me so I can read it? Yeah. I'm yeah. gonna be really bad otherwise. Yeah, I'll send it over. I usually try to read the questions because not all the attendees can see the questions so because sometimes it just comes to the panelists. So I'm just- Yeah. Trying to, oh, and just, somebody also asked about that two year limitation. That's not applicable to a uh, LLC, that's to a Nevada Asset Protection Trust. And a fraudulent conveyance is only if you take an asset away from a known creditor that puts you in solvent. So a lot of times what we do is we take somebody, we'll do a solvency affidavit, move everything into an asset protection trust, like a big chunk of their assets that are the low lying fruit if they're really worried. And then there is a two year period where if they don't make a claim, they can't touch it. And Nevada just enforced this against child support. It's the only state that does that. Like I'm not saying don't pay child support, but I am saying is that when there's a when there's a there are protections out there depending on your situation that you can make it really strong. 
All right, I started investing in multifamily as a passive uh, investment last year, and I'm planning to keep doing so. Uh, I wonder if it would make sense for me to set up an LLC. Um, yeah, so, so here's the deal. From a tax standpoint, it could make sense. And, and here's what I want you to think of this as. When you are a passive investor in a syndication, you are a passive period, unless you are part of that uh, general partner or the uh, manager of the entity. Otherwise, you are considered passive period. Like they're always gonna look at you and say, you're not a real estate professional. So you are a passive investment holder. The, um, I could just let that flow onto my return if I am in a syndication, I am getting that on my page two of my Schedule E. If I want to create a little more protection, I set up a Wyoming LLC to hold those interests. And the easiest way to think of this is you just created a, a safe that I put out in the desert and I buried it and that nobody can see. And I put my interest in those syndications and I threw it into that safe before I buried it. And I can pull that safe out anytime I want, but I'm the only one who could do it. So the only person that could possibly get to the syndication assets is you. And you're the only one that even knows it's out there. Um, so from an asset protection standpoint, there's not much better. You know, you could go through the extra expense of doing a Nevada Asset Protection Trust, but I don't, that's like a bazooka to a gunfight. We've been doing this a long time. We've had quite literally uh, claims made against clients that were in excess of $30 million when they were the only one with assets left during that great recession uh, where you had lenders calling notes due on big projects. And in all cases, uh, we had one in California, one in Utah, we've had some big ones. You're able to settle for whether there was any insurance and possibly a little money, but like on one case, it was over a $30 million claim that was settled for just over a million bucks. It's not gonna make the liability magically go away. What it does is it makes it to where your negotiating standpoint is considerably stronger so somebody doesn't just put their ears back and try to take everything that you own. Because at the end of the day, you still have control over it. The uh, pros and cons of doing an LLC is the cost of the maintenance at a, at a minimum. So if you're doing uh, Wyoming, the annual cost is going to be somewhere around eight to nine hundred dollars because you have to have a physical office in Wyoming unless you live there. So we have to use a virtual office and a registered agent. The state fee isn't all that much. It's like 50 bucks. The registered agent, 125 and the office is going to be around uh, six, seven hundred bucks. So it depends on what you're doing. Sometimes those things can be shared amongst multiple entities so that you end up with an actual entity cost, you know, it can get down into the, uh, a much lower figure if you're setting up a structure. But these things are set up to, uh, to be to where you control whether or not things get distributed out. That's the, that's the end all be all of it. So Toby, I tried um, going to the link. So I think essentially the link is just to set up the strategy call because it doesn't ask for your address anywhere. And I believe once the call is set up, maybe uh, they will Amy's get Amy's going to reach out and get everybody. Yeah. So we know it's you. So they, uh, they were supposed to have one in there. Help these days, right? No, I think uh, um, I'll make sure that we make it really easy. Does it not show the book and all that? Say it's free book. No, no. Oh, then it, uh, here, I might send you guys another uh, link if you don't mind me. Um, That's fine. We can do it yeah. offline. That's fine. Uh, so yeah. a couple more questions I want to go through. Uh, if I want to set up an entity similar to say Cherry Street Investments for syndicating business and want to deduct, deduct large startup costs like mentor fees from W2 income, what's the best entity and taxation status? If you want to write it off individually, then you're going to need to have that set up either as an S corp. Um, and that's probably the route I'm going is I need it to flow through onto me individually. So if I'm an active business, it's almost always going to be an S corp. And with an S corp, I can write off the losses up to the amount that I put into it. So um, if I put in $50,000 and I spent it on my startup costs, I will get a $50,000 ordinary loss deduction. So uh, it's, you, if you did a, a C Corp, you lose the ability to take that deduction. That's why C Corps tend to be something that we try to zero out. It's not something I can actually take an individual loss for. 
um, just because of the nature of the LLC. The losses stay in, excuse me, the nature of the C Corp. The losses stay inside the C Corp. Let's see if I can't find that link for y'all. Hmm. Uh, this is another question. I'm not sure I understand it. Uh, I would like to start investing in property and would like to invest, but I have minimum cash. What would you recommend? I want to get to the point where I invest and pay minimum to S Corp. I'm not sure I understand that, but maybe you do. They have a little bit of cash and they want to know where they start. Yeah. What would you recommend? I'm so, sorry, Vanetta, could you restate your question? Like, are you asking what would you invest in or... Uh, from a taxation standpoint, are you asking when you should set up the S Corp? I'm not sure I understand the question. Okay, one more question while we're waiting. Can I convert 1099 money to S Corp? Yeah, actually, I know what they're asking. And so, uh, Kishore, I assume that you're receiving that money individually, uh, probably as a realtor or something similar. And there is a case uh, where the IRS will allow you to treat that as being paid directly to an S Corp, but it requires two steps. Uh, it requires that you enter into an employee agreement where your, your exclusive services are for an S Corp. So you actually do an employment agreement with an S Corp and you let the broker know that you work exclusively for that S Corp. If you do that, it's uh, trying to remember the case. It's like, Flanagan or something like that. There was a the case where they say they'll allow you to treat that as though it was paid directly into the S Corp. If you do net Fleischer, wow, somebody just nailed that. <laughs> Who knew that? She, wow. She's and a, just, she's boom. A, I knew it began with an F, but I was like, <laughs> Flannery, somebody gets a star. Yeah. <laughs> Good job. And she's always on it. She's a CPA as well. So she knows. Yeah. That. So so I love it. That is like <laughs> I love the CPAs, by the way. They, uh, you you guys rock. I, I'm not a CPA. I'm just a, a lawyer person, but the CPAs are a lot of fun. The EAs are fun too. Uh, but it's, uh, The name is Flesha. I'm just going to type it here. I think it's always going to be uh, uh, probably Commissioner V. Fleischer. It, it, I'm trying to think. It might, I think it's Fleischer. I, I want to say there might be another letter or two on that. Sorry, guys, we are way over, but I want to get one last question. What's the downside of S Corp compared to LLC? Well, the LLC is not a tax treatment. So S Corp versus LLC, they're the uh, LLC can be taxed as a uh, S Corp. So the downside is that the LLC, if you uh, cancel it and you dissolve it, you lose a 1244 stock loss. Now you probably already took the loss individually anyway, so it, it probably, it's probably gonna be a push. Um, I will say that the LLCs generally give you a little more asset protection. So the, the most uh, accountants are gonna say, let's set up an LLC and tax it as an S Corp. I can't think of too many situations where I would just do the S Corp unless there's a specific statute, for example, if, uh, if your state required licensing and said, we will license an S Corp, but not a LLC, then I would set up the S Corp. But most states are progressive enough now. They like the LLCs. That wasn't the case when I started doing this. Um, it was a long, long, long time ago. And Angie does rock. <laughs> yeah she's always on it like she attended another webinar with me and a tax uh, a cpa actually and he couldn't remember a lot of things and she was just going at it and i was like go yeah. Angie. <laughs> there's a way to do it it's a tricky way the other way that and i want to get angie's input on this a lot mm -hmm. of accountants will take it and they'll put it on uh they'll take they'll put it on a schedule c and they'll just zero it out so they'll have the income and then they'll just have an expense written to the s corp and they'll do it that way too so you'll have a small sole proprietorship return with just you know a revenue item and an expense item zeroing it out i tend to get a little freakish about that i just assume report it to the uh uh to the s corp but i always have to ask the accountant whether they would do that all right, we are way over. Uh, there is one more question. Do you want me to go or do you want me to just take that offline? <laughs> I want to be no, responsible. No, no. Uh, would 
an LLC taxed as an S corp work in New Hampshire because of the dividends and interest tax? Oh, they have a uh, in New Hampshire. You would have to. I don't know. I have to go look it up. There are a few East Coast states where the state does not recognize the corporate, the S corp. Like New York's that way, I believe. Like what they'll do is they'll say, "Oh, we're going to treat you for state tax purposes as a C corp." The Fed, you're always okay, but the, there is a kind of a funky thing out there. I just can't remember whether it's New Hampshire. I don't think so. New Hampshire's not sitting in the in in that dull area of your head where you get that same question once every three years, where it seems familiar. But there but there are some states that, from a federal standpoint, it's a S corp. From a state standpoint, they're going to treat it as a C corp. And let me give you an example of, of another state that does some weird stuff. You can accelerate depreciation on real estate for federal tax purposes in all 50 states, but the state may not recognize the acceleration. So like California doesn't accelerate, it doesn't recognize the acceleration. Uh, it's some weird stuff. You could also file for unemployment for, uh, for your own S corp in most states. And in some states they want, it's usually if you're paying into state unemployment when you're doing your payroll, it's goofy stuff. But like I said, there's no one size fits all. We have to look at that. Uh, and then that's what we do as far as the structure. We're not gonna charge you for the structure guys. And it's not, a, it's not an arm bending. What we try to do is say, this is what we would think. We do this day in and day out. And we say, this is what a good structure would probably look like. Um, if you want us to quote you on it, we certainly can. If you don't, you don't. Read the yeah. book, get your mind, get some mind food. Usually you start realizing that there's some wisdom in having people that know this stuff around you. And some of you, like, again, I could say that you have a CPA on this call that's really good. And I would say, you always want people that do what you do. You want people that are doing what you're doing because there's only one way. It's the old Nike theory. The only way you're going to do it is just by doing it. And so you don't really appreciate the tax aspects of, of uh, real estate until you've owned real estate until you've had another business. And I get stuff all the time. And we've, there's literally 200 of us and we're bouncing stuff off each other all the time. And I get stuff every day where I'm like, oh, I don't know, that's weird. So thank you, Toby. I just wanted to wrap this up. And I also wanted to say that I attended your boot camp, like a three day boot camp. I know you're used to talking for hours and hours up there. So. <laughs> No, you're kind of like, this is too short for me. I'm just getting warmed up. <laughs> so I did all the stuff we didn't talk about. I'm like, oh. <laughs> I, I did a three day boot camp with these guys and it was incredibly informative and I learned a lot of things. So I highly recommend checking them out and, um, you know, definitely sesh up, sign up for the strategy session because I, I actually did that during the boot camp and I got a lot of, out of it. So please do make use of that um, free session with them. And if you think they are valuable, then you can sign up. You don't have to, there's no pressure sales here. <laughs> uh, so thank you, Toby, um, for, for being here and sharing all this information with us. And I'm looking forward to um, more people making use of the strategy session. Uh, thank you all. I know we went way over. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Angie. Um, we will wrap up now. Thank you. Have a Thank good night, you. everyone. You got it. Thanks, Toby. Bye, everyone. Good night.